Hello and welcome to a new episode of Shashka Pursuit. So today we want to dive a little bit deeper into the history of the Shashka itself. So what exactly is a Shashka? The Shashka is a kind of saber, and I know this might be a little bit debatable, but the Shashka is a kind of saber um, with some very unique characteristics, like the lack of a handguard, and usually, the, at least for the Caucasus, uh, the original one, the scabbard that will um, hold the handle. So usually a scabbard goes up to the handle and the original Caucasian one or a Caucasus one will uh, insert the handle as well. So this might be an indicator for a shashka but we know that there are other sword types uh, all over the world. So from Afghanistan the Cuban knife is also one edged uh, kind of long knife saber and we know some examples from the Bedouin of the uh, North African region as well and we do have examples all over the world so the, most of the Philippine weapons are without a handguard so this might be not a definition for the Shashka itself but um, it's a very regional thing so maybe this might be an indicator to what exactly is a Shashka it's like with the definition of a saber, quite complicated thing, because if you say a saber is a curved blade with one single edge and maybe a false edge or a short edge on the back, um, we come to problems because when we look at some saber types in the uh, early 20th century, we do have sabers that are completely straight. So to find a definition isn't very easy, but to say this is a regional character will work for, for the beginning of the Shashka, later when the uh, Russian army adopted it, it also became a general term. Shashka was used and is still used in some areas as a general term for uh, the four-bladed weapon, saber, sword or what else. <coughs> what another thing characteristic for the Shashka is the form of the grip, the hilt, so there's no pommel, no, no counterweight. Uh, in the sense of, yeah, let's say, more most European swords, but we have this hook here. So, people say this is for convenience to better draw it, especially when the sheet goes up, up to the hilt. So if you have a, the shashka on your side and you want to draw it, go inside, and then for fast drawing or fast, uh, yeah, for fast cuts from the sheet, or the scabbard, better said. Uh, the other thing is if you swing around it, this really helps you because with the rotation the shashka pulls itself there. It gives you a pretty nice idea for edge alignment, at least for me. Um, yeah, There is a saying that the shashka should be as light as a feather, uh, flexible as a wine and uh, sharp as a razor. So the early ones, the let's say um, from the Caucasus region, the Caucasus is a huge uh, area with a lot of different tribes and ethnicities so and we do find the Cauc uh, in the Caucasus the Shashka from Georgia, Georgia with different appeals and appearances up to the uh, northern ones which were probably the influence for the later Cossack Shashkas when they uh, had their confrontations with the Cherkessian uh, tribes in the northern Caucasus when they settled in the uh, Don area Cuban area. So the interesting thing is you can sometimes read that a shashka should be with a weight around 300 and 500 grams which is very very difficult to achieve especially when you have a very very thin blade. So usually the, the original shashkas or the early ones were pretty uh, they had a wider blade a very thin blade. They were sharp. The shashkas are excellent cutters, but this comes with some, yeah, let's say problems. If this is our steel blade, to achieve a weight, we have to reduce material. But if we reduce material, you can see that with this piece of paper, it becomes very, very uh, floppy. So what we have to do is, and we see this in general all over the world with, with bladed weapons to, to reduce materials but strengthen the structure uh, we see fullers all over there so we created here some kind of fullers and you see the difference 
So this is the same material we just changed the geometrical um, yeah the overall static geometrical uh, properties of the blade so we do have the same amount of material and it's very very stiff but but to say where the weapon comes from is a very very difficult uh, thing because we do have to consider everything in the whole context are there different uh, cultural influences from from external cultures what is yeah the resources we have in the area the overall know-how there so just because people have iron doesn't necessarily mean they know how to produce weapons or anything out of it so and um, the shashka itself is quite easy to make so it's, it's just a single edge blade you don't have to, to uh, use a lot of materials for a hill construction basically uh, the usual hill construction is two scales of wood riveted onto the handle we do have especially later when the shashka is more and more piece of the attire of the tribal um, traditional outfits they become very 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 uh, detailed uh, silver very decorated weapons and uh, symbols of status but uh, generally speaking for the easy production uh, the shashka is quite easy to make and that might indicate something for its origin so maybe we can say um, the shashka literal the word means in Czechian or uh, Czechoski language uh, depending on who you ask means something like long knife or big knife and if you look in the central European area uh, of the Middle Ages for example we have the lange messer or große messer which also means long knife or big knife which first was some kind of uh, tool like a machete and later developed more more from a self-defense civilian weapon to a weapon of war so especially in the 16th century we do have the Landsknecht uh, use, use very preferred very much preferred the uh, uh, longer or große messer so this might be a same development but in another other region maybe there was influence maybe not doesn't really matter because um, the thing is that you take a knife draw it longer it's quite similar hilt construction for uh, the shashka and the long knife lange messer as well and this can be the origin of this so maybe the earliest examples we do have is one depiction of the shashka with uh, saint george slaying a dragon and a museum piece dated to the early 1800s so we can't tell for sure what the different influences were for the development of this blade so we like I said, we have examples from Afghanistan, not only the Cuban knife, but also a sh very Shashka-like um, examples. People debate if there's any influence because the Afghan ones do have five rivets and what you normally find in the Caucasus region are uh, riveted hills with just three uh, rivets. I don't know if this is a major point for difference. Different. This is the very elaborated shaped blade, the uh, S, more almost S-shaped blade with the ears, and we do find these ears um, on the end of the grip of some shashkas too. And even if we look at the modern, let's say modern ones from mid 1800s up to uh, 1950s, we do have the remnants of these ears too in the shashkas. Some people say, okay, it's to put your finger inside and throw it, but I don't really see the advantage of this. Um, but this is all everything is some kind to debate um, What we do know is when and how the Cossacks later adopted the weapon from the mountainous tribes in the northern Caucasus when they uh, fought there Where they settled there especially in the Don region so there we do have a connection from the Cossacks they originally came from the Ukraine settled there and then expanded and were <coughs> very much responsible for the uh, expansion of Russia to Siberia. Um, this will have an, another impact on the development of the, sh of the Shashka later. So why did the Cossacks adopt this, preferred this uh, kind of weapon? Well, it is 
said this uh, the Shashka is a very very good cutter. I cut uh, some myself and I have to agree they are excellent cutters. I really like them. They are light, nimble and they uh, want to cut. So the lack of the uh, counterbalance and the pommel pretty much invites you to deliver good cuts. Um, another thing is the lack of hand protection is a huge disadvantage in the right context. So we do have some some um, uh, examples that other weapons were used in the Caucasus uh, region, especially in Georgia with the uh, Kefshur tribes. They used small hand guards and sab sabers. Mm, they look more like Kilich or uh, Shamshir weapons. Uh, sometimes with straight, sometimes with uh, with curved blades, and they used a buckler. And you, when you have a buckler to defend your hand, uh, and the handguard isn't quite very necessary. Another thing is that the uh, Cherkessian people were very known for their horse riding skills. And if you think about a, a hit and run tactic, uh, you don't really need a hand protection when you do assaults or something like this. So you. You more ride by, deliver cuts, and then you leave, you run off. Uh, so you don't really want to en engage the enemy. But this is the way to fight to fence with the Shashka is a different thing now. So I'll do videos about this because it's a very interesting thing. Do you really need to fence in a different style or isn't the impact as bad, big as you might think? But again, this is a topic for another video. Um, so, the Cossacks adopted the weapon, and from the, yeah, we can say from the 1830s on, there is a steady development to, to fit the demand of the Cossacks on horseback or on foot. And, like I said, we have the other Cossack hosts with their different um, demands and approaches on the Shashka. So, we do have the development that they, especially the, it said that this is the Asian approach of the of the, uh, of the shashka that the scabbard is more again stops after the ricasso uh, at the hilt doesn't uh, insert the hilt anymore so it goes back there um, some people say it's because if rain comes into the opening you have up here the whole blade will rust um, and this will close it so i don't really know um, I have force in the brain with these things, but if you are on campaign or so, that might be really an issue. Uh, the other thing is the shape of the blade turned to a more straight saber. It became a little bit longer, um, and when you when you look at the uh, Tanor Tanirovka uh, version, this is pretty much still like the Northern Caucasian approach uh, of the Shashka, but. Yeah, like I said, it's be it becomes more straight, less curved, and a little bit thicker. So, if you s think in the context of a self-defense weapon, uh, it can be thin because you don't have as much exchanges or um, hitting hitting gun barrels or anything. You fight against someone without armor, so there is a thin and good blade optimum. But if you consider a more battle situation, you want to have a more uh, rigid blade that you can let's say abuse more so it won't break won't chip as fast as, uh, uh, as the original one with a very very thin blade um, especially if you think that you in this uh, age you encounter troops with bayonets and gun barrels and so the hand-to-hand -hand combat you will have then is more solid objects unarmored but solid objects you still can chop through cloth or anything depends always depends so if you're in a more southern region people aren't as closed as thick um, as padded as they are probably in other regions as like siberia so you need different approaches to to have maybe a more thrust orientated weapon uh, counter to the before very uh, slashing hitting cutting orientated cutting heavy uh, weapon and then we see the change of the grip that becomes a, a three-pieced one with brass. At the beginning the wood handle was straight still and the, yeah, let's say, bird head-like 
uh, end piece of the grip we see up until to the 1950s. So this is the next changes. They come, blade becomes straighter, thicker, and of course, always the context. The Tanoyevka uh, version was still used up until to 1910, First World War. So not everyone uh, used these, and not everyone used a shashka so we do have a lot of pictures from different cavalry re regiments from the Russian Empire which used still like Western sabers and this is the let's say coming to the end of the 19th century we see that the shashka that was more standardized by the Empire for the co uh, Cossack troops was more a mixed thing between the Western saber uh, in terms of the blade and the shashka, so the leg of the of the hand protection of the hand guard with their grip. There are a lot of small changes that come after this. So uh, the grip changes, minor details, uh, becomes a bit bulkier in the middle to to allow better grip. And yeah, what what the biggest change was the 1881 model, the standard model later, uh, which somehow wasn't received as well as you might think. Um, major thing was uh, that they formed the handle to a more S-like shape in general. That means that you are off the um, center line with it. So people said this is a bad. Uh, so people said or complained about that it will uh, downgrade the cutting abilities. But what it allows you better is to to give you a better point control so if you want to to engage someone to step with this example you have to correct if i want to to direct the origin of the blade with a grip in line for a thrust i have to um, if i want to step i have to adjust my my wrist so i have to go off center and if I would have a S-shaped guard uh, grip, I could s try to steady uh, with an S-shaped grip. I could direct my thrust in a direct fashion. So here I have to adjust. And if it would be more S-like, I didn't need to. The early 1900s, we find another model appearing, uh, the Dragoon version, the uh, Dragonskaya uh, Shashka, which, contrary to the what we might think would be a Shashka, does have a light knuckle bar. So, um, while different countries in Europe adopted a more elaborated um, hilts, basket hilts, or uh, with rings, or they get pretty fancy. They prefer the small knuckle bow. Some people say, okay, this is better if you if you wear it. So a bulkier hand protection would hinder you somehow, and this is easier to draw. Even the Dragunskaya was worn upside down, so the edge facing backwards. Um, it was pretty much the same blade with a big fuller and the small false edge at the back but uh, was still called a shashka. If we might see it, uh, if, we, if we would see it, we sh would automatically think this is a, a saber. But yeah, again, shashka became a word for almost all kinds of saber during this time. Um, we have pictures as well, so there, the western style sabers were still used, different troop styles or in one to different uniforms, and the shashka was predominantly the standard uh, melee weapon, secondary weapon for the uh, Cossack regiment, so on foot or on horseback. And with secondary weapon we have to keep in mind that this is not the primary weapon for the Cossacks. They have lances, carabines, uh, the shashka and most often uh, kinjal or uh, bibut worn as an additional backup weapon, let's say like this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, like I said in the beginning, the shashka was issued up until to 1950, so uh, it was 
as far as I know, one of the last melee weapons, sword like objects used in World War II and a little bit beyond. So, the last um, manual for the use of the Shashka on horseback I found is from 1954. After that, the Red Army stopped using cavalry in their. Uh, in, in the army. So cavalry did have a very huge advantage in open fields, so if you look at Central Asia or Russian with vast steps, you're very mobile there, but yeah, it become obsolete with the time and uh, technolog technological um, progress. So it started during the, the Russian Empire that the civil use of, of weapon training was banned and the whole Cossack Dom uh, almost vanished to disappear during the uh, Soviet era and up until the 1990s there was no really lived tradition of Cossacks. Then it started reappearing and what we do have now is the yeah the Shashka is the symbol of the Cossacks next to, to the uh, Nagaika whip and the uh, Kubanka head here. So this is integral cultural heritage part now of the Cossacks as well as don't forget the Caucasus tribes where the Cossacks do have a lot of traditions from so. but what we have too because of the lack of the living tradition till now we have a lot of different approaches no one really knows how they fought with it there are some manuals I found um, which I want to to, to recreate the way people fought with the Shashka, fencing with Shashka in a more historical fencing approach. Um, you know you have videos all over YouTube with the so-called um, Flankirova, which is the uh, salt spinning of the Shashka. Uh, and of course we do have the whole uh, backyard cutting community uh, cutting water bottles in your backyard. This is part of the Shashka and its tradition. So we know that they practice uh, cutting on tatami-like straw objects, on uh, straw dummies and um, a wine rod sticked into the ground. Then you try to cut it down. The kubanka is on top of it and if you cut in the right angle it will fall down and stay on the leftover piece you do have uh, left. Uh, other things is every five centimeters there are sections on a stick and you try to hit inside these these sections to to train your accurate accuracy uh, and yeah like i said we do have the whole uh, backyard community which is part of the shashka and its tradition but it's not all so the way the people in the caucasus mountains fought with it is lost so you may find some examples um, from the Kefshu people, they they use the buckler uh, predominantly with their weapons, so a saber or shashka. Um, we have some manuals, like I said, from the Russian Empire period. We have mention of the use of the shashka in other literature, and we do have the last ones from the uh, 1920s, 30s, and the 1950s. But what we sometimes find on YouTube doesn't do justice to the weapon and how it was fought. So my approach for future content is to shed some light on this, recreate the way they fought with the Shashka, and of course uh, bring things into context. This is my interpretation, so do you <laughs> don't have to agree with everything I say. So I hope you liked this uh, brief overview of the history of the Shashka and I could help you with something. Um, and if you know some more things, leave it in the comments. Uh, I'm happy to find more information to shed the light there, get rid of misconceptions and mystifications. The happier I am. So special thanks goes to Ruslan Urajiktin or Urajiktin. Uh, sorry for butchered your name. Uh, found some of your papers uh, online, and I'm really thankful. You really helped me a lot with this. If you ever see this one, I hope you like it. Thank you for watching. Goodbye and stay tuned.